But how do you do it? And most churches, at least the ones that I'm acquainted with, pastors and leaders are aware of the fact that some of these things are taking place in their church. There are people that are involved in immorality. There are people that are being divisive. There are people that are living an undisciplined life. There's some false teaching. They don't quite know how to deal with it. It's messy. It's difficult. It's time consuming. It's easier just to let it go. Hope maybe somehow, some way it will go away. But it doesn't go away. It saps the life out of the church and the blessing of God disappears. And they wonder why their churches aren't prospering. Why aren't we growing? Why aren't we seeing more people come to know the Lord? It's because in that body, it's very unhealthy. And in a healthy body that's immature and unhealthy will not, cannot reproduce itself. They say, where do I start? What do I do? How do we go about it? Let me try to give you some very practical, biblical guidelines. What's the process? The clearest passage of scripture is Matthew 18, verses 15 through 17. There's a four-step process that must be taken. But it's very important before you jump into Matthew 18, verses 15 through 17, that you read the context, the whole chapter. Because the first part of it, in verses 10 through 14 especially, is a parable of the lost sheep. And it's of the shepherd who leaves the 99, goes after the one lost sheep. Doesn't go after the lost sheep to punish it. Doesn't ignore the lost sheep, but goes after it. Then after the teaching of Matthew 18, 15 through 17, there's another parable. And that's the parable of showing mercy to those that have sinned. It's the parable of the unmerciful servant who was shown mercy but didn't extend mercy. So in the middle of that, Jesus gives us four steps that must be taken. Let's think these through ac uh, accurately step by step. Step one involves an individual encounter. Matthew 18, verse 15 says, if your brother sins against you, Go to him in private, keyword. Don't talk to other people about it. Don't, don't uh, make a public issue out of it. Go to him in private. And the purpose of that meeting is to get him back in fellowship, like I went to my friend Clyde, privately. We can deal with this now. We don't have to make a public issue out of it. Uh, we can deal with it. And you, you go to him, and you have to make sure that you have facts. It's not rumor. Sometimes I've had to go to people and say, you know, I don't know if this is true or not. I need to come to you privately and ask you. This is what I've heard. Is this true? And you have to interact with them. And if they deny it, then you have to make sure that you have the facts. And maybe you have to do more investigation. Also, when you go to someone privately, you have to, before you go, do some self-evaluation. Am I going in the power of the Spirit? Is my life clean before the Lord? Am I going to show mercy and grace and love? Or am I going in a self-righteous, arrogant way to try to set them straight? What are your motives in going? The motive should always be I want to restore them to the Lord and to our fellowship. So step one, you want to resolve it. And if that person responds, sometimes I've had them respond when I've gone in private. End of, end of discussion, it's, it's over. Get them back in fellowship. Don't need to share with anyone else. Don't need to do any more than just encourage them in their walk with the Lord. It's finished. But if you go to them in private, like I did to my friend, there is that resistance, that arrogance. Yes, I did it. That's accurate. It happened. But I'm not going to change. I'm not repentant. 
I don't want to be restored. What do you do? Matthew 18, verse 16, second step. Take additional witnesses with you. It says, then go to him again with two or three witnesses. The purpose of the witnesses, as I understand it, are twofold. One, to make sure that you've gone in the right spirit and make sure you have the facts and to make sure that person really is resistant. And they can plead with the person too. Maybe your approach wasn't the best. Maybe, maybe they begin now to see the seriousness of what was done and that two other people, in addition to yourself, want to help them get back on track. And that can be a very positive thing and it can be resolved right there. And they can make sure that you've approached them right, you have the facts, the person is resistant. But supposing after they go with you, you plead with the person, you go through that whole process, which I did with our friend Clyde, and still, no. In fact, he became so arrogant towards those people that uh, he began to accuse them of things. He said, you're not perfect either. I know what you've done, and that defiant. No brokenness, no repentance. What do you do? The third step. You have to involve the congregation. We're talking now of a local church. The purpose of involving the congregation now is not to embarrass the person, not to humiliate them, but to call for prayer and to let the people know what you're dealing with. And I've always told the individual, you leave me with no option now. I've come to you privately. I've come to you with witnesses. We've come to you the best that we can with a desire to see you restored, you continue to resist. So now, what we are doing is I have to take it to the congregation, let them know people will begin to pray for you, and at any time you want to respond to me, to the elders of the church, restoration is possible. Step four. He still says, I don't care. You can take it to the church. It doesn't matter to me. That's actually what he said to me. He said, I'm going to leave the church anyway. I don't care what they think. I had to go to the church and to tell them, and he still wouldn't uh, respond, so we had to take step four. What is step four? Exclusion from the fellowship. If they're a member, or even if they aren't a member, you let them know they're not welcome to continue in that lifestyle and continue to attend the services of the church. The purpose of that is to cooperate with God and putting pressure on them. And that, uh, that works. It's a last resort. It's the last thing you do. It's step four. You do it very reluctantly. It has to be done right and of the right spirit with the right motives to make sure you've done the other three steps uh, but you do it with a lot of sorrow. You don't do it in an arrogant, self-righteous, proud way at all. And I remember when we had to do it, I left there with a very heavy heart, but with a peace that we had followed Scripture and that God would honor that. And God would just say, I didn't know what the outcome would be. I had no idea. All I knew is to the best of our ability and the power of the Spirit, we followed the directives of, of Scripture, and we left the results to God. Those four steps of Matthew 18, 15 through 17, are absolutely crucial to be done right, properly, in the power of the Spirit. We invite you to participate in the International Bible Teaching and Gospel Sharing Project. Whether these Christian expanded educational opportunities will become available to people around the world depends on all of us. We very much need and appreciate your prayer and financial support. For more information, please visit tvsseminary.com.